<sighs> Gregor Otero here, and I'm going to explain in detail how Tesla towers work, and the concept behind not just the towers, but ancient monuments and how trees work. Uh, two videos that will, would help to understand more of this video. It's a video called How Trees Dance with Gaia. And that talks about the dynamics of trees in terms of diamagnetism and uh, how they oscillate with the ionosphere, which we're going to talk about also in this video. But this video is also about biomimicry of that process. And there's another video is understanding the wave structure in the tube torus. The um, reason why that one's important is it talks about uh, waveforms. And you can also go say this yourself in studying longitudinal and transverse waves and the standing wave component of those two forms of waves. So there's really four different types of, of waves. Um, and so first let's talk about the, the fundamental concept which is talked about in the, the tree video is with the ionosphere. So the Sun is constantly emitting solar winds all times. And they're constantly bombarding the Earth. Those solar winds are composed of ionized hydrogen, which is protons without their electron. Uh, I'm going to talk about protons and electrons, and until we fully understand what a proton electron is, um, and I intuitively understand this isn't how things are with, in terms of particles, but we're going to use this jargon to help explain these concepts, because I haven't figured out how to articulate what actually is going on due to our language and the science that currently exists. So, protons, or ionized hydrogen, start building up in the atmosphere and they start collecting. And as that happens, there's a positive charge that starts to build up around the Earth. Now the Earth is, is, has a neutral charge around it and is slightly negative in different parts, especially at the tops of mountains. Mountain peaks are the most charged of, uh, are the most negatively charged everywhere on the planet because it's that those electrons are reaching up and trying to touch the protons. The negative charge is reaching towards the positive charge, so the highest uh, electron density is at the tips of mountains. Uh, this also relates to why mountains are sacred by many ancients, um, or even cultures today. <laughs> and I just happen to be tw 20 miles from Mount Mitchell, the tallest mountain on the east coast. There's some very interesting things about Mount Mitchell and um, the ley lines that uh, go around it. You can almost draw like a nice circle around Mount Mitchell and those major cities that are an average of 250 miles from it, such as Savannah, Georgia, Charleston, North Carolina, or South Carolina, uh, uh, Columbus, Georgia, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, Huntsville, Alabama, Cincinnati, Ohio, there's one more, Louisville, Kentucky. Those are all approximately 250 miles, give or take 10 miles, from Asheville. And so, it's a dynamic. We're going to talk about these dynamics and ley line structures and how these towers can benefit from each other. It's a symbiosis. And so, back to the ionosphere. This charge builds up, and mountains are reaching up toward this charge. Well, what happens is something called a dielectric breakdown. And so I'll explain a dielectric breakdown. Dielectric breakdown is where a dielectric or an insulator, dielectric is usually used as a term instead of an insulator, denoting that it can polarize a magnetic field, everything pol in an electric field, everything polarizes in an electric field. So a real world example is my hands, all right? And so um, one thing that happens when you hold your hands apart is you can build up a charge between them because there's a natural energy flowing through your body. When you, as soon as you put your hands together, you connect those energies and they start spinning opposingly through your, your arms and your body, which relates to praying. And so you're essentially creating a basic toroidal coil function. Um, and so this is a balanced form of energy. And as soon as you pull your hands apart, you start building up at your hands. This is how uh, Reiki uh, practitioners take advantage of healing. Because the energy builds up in your, in your hands, you can start to create electromagnetic fields. If you put uh, two different types of metals on your hands, such as a copper ring and a zinc ring, 
uh, the copper will take on a positive charge and the zinc will take on a negative charge, drastically increasing this effect. And so, oh, see, now I got off topic. I think I did. Uh, um, where was I? Ionosphere, charges, electric, oh, I was explaining how dielectrics polarize. Um, in electric fields. See, we can go on tangents all day because all this information, it's connected. It's all connected. And so the beautiful thing is people keep asking me questions of things I've never thought about before, but I have all this information connected everywhere that's like I'm just this organic computer now where people can just feed me information and come back with an answer being like, whoa, and I just learned something. And it's really just realizing what I already know by connecting the dots of information I have. So I'm going to try to stay focused <laughs> as best I can. And uh, the energy that polarizes between your hands, if this is a, taking on a negative charge, this is taking on a positive charge, the air molecules in between it um, will they'll electrically orient themselves in the opposing direction and supporting the charge. And so there's specific dielectrics that can support more charge than others. Water is um, a, uh, a material that drastically supports uh, electric fields. Uh, same with uh, titanium dioxide, or rutile, which is used as a pigment, the white pigment in um, paints, as uh, in sunblock. Uh, those are the two common materials that are the best dielectrics available. And uh, so, the atmosphere is a dielectric, and it will polarize in this electric field, supporting it. And at certain parts of the atmosphere, we probably support it more, depending on the composition. Because I can't imagine the composition is all balanced around the entire Earth. That I don't know for a fact. That I'm making a very logical assumption that there is a difference of composition um, around the Earth. And so there will be different polarizations. And also, when you have a mountain reaching closer, you're going to have a greater polarization. There's also parts of the atmosphere that are closer to the Earth than other parts. But the ionosphere is closer. And so, the thing that happens, though, is there's only a certain amount of charge the insulators can handle. And so for example, um, epoxy is a common dielectric I use. I like to mix epoxy with titanium dioxide and get a good composite because titanium dioxide supports a lot of electrical charge. It can um, support strong electric fields. It can't handle a lot of voltage. You can almost say one's current and one's voltage. One can store energy, one can handle velocity of energy, which is voltage. And epoxy can handle a lot of voltage, but it's not great at supporting electric fields. So they're a good composite together, mixing the two. And epoxy can handle about 40 kilovolts, um, depending on the epoxy, for every millimeter um, of thickness. And so the atmosphere can hold a certain amount of voltage uh, before it discharges, which right now is the voltage between the difference between the ground in the ionosphere is about 30 volts a foot. So to me that's it's handling about 30 volts. Even though the, uh, the atmosphere I know for a foot of air can handle a lot more than 30 volts. So that is actually the best measurement. But that's the differential between the two. It's about 30 volts which you can tap into. And so there's certain points on the planet that there's a breakdown. And what that breakdown is is a lightning strike. And not only does the lightning strike or it's technically electrons traveling from the ground of the earth up to the storm system, that energy keeps going up. And it's been well documented the past several years of seeing these sprites. Um, I think that's the term they use for sprites of um, lightning strikes continuing up all the way up to the ionosphere. It's, it's a long progression of energy um, as those electrons eventually reach the hydrogen, the ionized hydrogen in the ionosphere, thus creating stabilized hydrogen and that hydrogen will also be a little bit heavier and will start to fall down into our atmosphere. So the building block the basic building blocks of life start to move into our atmosphere. Tip my phone. Um, and uh, the the next question is how does oxygen come into play to start to bond with that hydrogen to create water? The real building block of this plant. Uh, another story, another day. So there's this process of lightning strikes, this discharge. And the thing is, lightning strikes are constant on the planet. 
uh, especially in uh, humid tropical parts of planet Earth. Because they're constant, you have a constant oscillation or change in the electric field, the polarization between the ionosphere and the ground. And that change creates a ver in the vertical axis an oscillating electric field. Now, what happens when you create a changing electric field is it also creates a changing magnetic field. Thus, you have an electromagnetic wave. So in the vertical axis of our planet, there is an electromagnetic wave oscillating. You can tap into this. You can tap into this with an antenna system. As Nikola Tesla did in the turn of the 20th century with attempting to build Wardenclyffe Tower. He, he achieved it with smaller versions, but Warrencliffe was a large enough scale version on Long Island that could have powered all of the Manhattan area. Now, I'm going to explain a little bit more of this system and how to step up this system and how it relates to ley lines and also relating to the system I've been developing. And so, the first thing to do is you need to get the tower in residence. Actually, I'll, I'll get even a little simpler than that. We're going to describe a few basic concepts of the tower. So, all right. So, the tower can be made of several different things, but we're going to simplify it now explain the concepts. All right. We're going to put a sphere at the top. Now, and at the base, we're going to put a capacitor. This is a symbol for a capacitor. And then a ground. This is our ground. That's a symbol for a ground. So I'm sort of mixing pictures with electric symbols. So this here is the top of the tower. The top of the tower will take on a negative charge, okay? As it's reaching toward the atmosphere, which contains positive charges, okay? And so if we have a capacitor in here at the bottom, this will consist of positive charges, this will consist of negative charges. And it's pulling in all these negative charges into this bomb capacitor. Now, one of the things that Tesla said is that you need to insulate the system. So, an important thing to share about Tesla is he created a bunch of, the, bunch of patents. And these patents are all parts of the system of Warrencliffe. He didn't publish a patent about Warrencliffe Tower. He published patents that describe all the components of the system because it requires intelligence to put them together and so they uh, science couldn't fall into the wrong hands. He had a great distrust, distrust for society and lack, in, lack of faith in terms of where humanity was going. He wanted to change that, as do a lot of us. And so... Alright. Well, every time there's a lightning discharge, you can imagine that several of these negative charges, these electrons, travel down this tower. But then the solar winds start to refill the ionosphere and then they go back up the tower. And so in the tower you have an oscillation. Now the thing is there's a specific wavelength of this oscillation happening in, in the atmosphere. But the, the, the velocity in which the energy travels in the atmosphere, the electromagnetic energy, is different than the velocity that travels say in copper. And so the wavelength and copper is going to be shorter than that in the atmosphere because copper is very conductive, much, much more conductive than our atmosphere. So what we're trying to tune is the frequency and match the frequency that's, that's occurring of this oscillation up and down, up and down, up and down. And so uh, one of the ways to tune that is, well, there's two ways. You can tune the inductance or you can tune the capacitance. The inductance or inductor is a coil. Um, and inductance is the magnetic field it creates uh, when, when you run energy, electricity, through the coil. Capacitance um, 
is the electric charge, the electric, um, uh, which relates to the, um, the electric field that's built in between this positive and negative charge. Um, and so inductors and inductance and capacitance are the two primary features of electromagnetism. And you can tune either one to bring something into frequency. And so you can tune this bottom capacitor. And one way to do that is to adjust the distance between these two capacitive plates. You can, um, well that's, that's usually the simplest way. Um, at the, an easy way to do that is to take a, say, a copper tube and insulate it, and then take another copper tube that's slightly bigger so you can slide it into it, and sliding one in and out, you can adjust the capacitance. That's an easy way to do it. Um, if you take a, an aluminum uh, pull, like my fire staff there in the corner, um, that's an, an, a hammock. Alright, it's a uh, it's not oxidized, but you can get aluminum that's oxidized and creates aluminum oxide. Also, a really great insulator, and for every millimeter, it's about uh, 40 uh, kilovolts. And you can store about uh, three times the charge that epoxy can. And it's also really, really thermal conductive, and that's not a common thing for something to be electrically insulative and thermally conductive, such as also diamond. So you can actually get aluminum, ox aluminum pole oxidized and slide it into a copper or aluminum pole to do this, and that's a very simple way to make a capacitor. As in, so, what I'm implying is you can buy oxidized uh, aluminum, and it's a simple way to make a really good capacitor. Alright, to continue the, uh, the tuning process. And so, uh, there was a man named Ray Bradburn who replicated Tesla's design. Um, uh, less than a decade ago, and what he did is he mounted a bunch of copper at the top, flat, basically a big flat sheet of layers of copper at the top here, and uh, at the base he attached, he had a capacitor, and he also insulated this. Oh, so this is what I was going to talk about earlier, is insulating the tower. This whole part needs to be insulated from the outside so it can store up charge and it doesn't leak into the air. One thing that I talked about in my tree video, I think I talked about this in my tree video, if you hammer a nail into a tree, um, uh, it'll cause an energy leak into the system, out of the system, and um, the tree will, uh, a copper nail, uh, a tree will die in about a year. And uh, it's, it's the same for these towers, because beneath the bark of a tree is the sap, which is conductive, and it's forming the same, the same property. Now, uh, Tesla talked about insulating uh, the towers too. He said with a transparent insulator, which to me relates to the capacitor at the top, uh, in that uh, he said that uh, he needs a transparent insulator, which makes me think of uh, the leaves of trees. Well, the bark of a tree is not transparent. Well, Ray Bradburn just had a bunch of copper at the top of his tower and had a wire going down to where he had a tunable inductor. A tunable inductor can consist of, say, a PVC tube with a wire getting wrapped around it, so inside another PVC tube with a, another wire wrapped around it. And the thing is, you can have one tube slide inside the other tube, and you can tune, tune the inductors that way. Um, or that's a tunable transformer. Um, which isn't exactly the same thing. So that's still an important concept in terms of uh, one of Tesla's ideas. Tunable inductor usually consists of having a coil, like so, um, but in the core of it you have a piece of iron and then you can move it in and out to change the inductance. I think, I'm not positive, so don't quote me on this, that you can tune with a tunable transformer. I am not positive though. Um, um, but a tunable transformer allows you to easily couple the primary and secondary and bring them into resonance with each other. That's what this takes advantage of. However, with a Tesla tower, uh, tuning an inductor this way, um, you don't want to tune it with iron because the frequencies are too high and the iron would overheat. Um, it can't handle the frequencies. 
Um, and so Tesla was a big proponent of air core transformers. What you can do, as I said, is tuning the capacitor easily. And um, when you can tune the capacitance um, and, and have a fixed inductance, uh, you can bring the tower into the right frequency. When it's in the right frequency, it will start to oscillate with the ionosphere. And when that happens, you can start to build up the inertia of that tower. The trick then is to drain the energy from the tower without draining the inertia built up in the tower. And there's a few ways to do that. Uh, so, one of the big things is a spark gap. And you can put a spark gap in between these, let me adjust this a little, put a spark gap in between these two capacitor plates. One of the things Tesla did to increase the spark gap frequency of his firing um, is to put a magnet that was perpendicular to the spark gap. It would cause this little spark to then twist and it would uh, uh, reduce the frequency of the spark. You can actually maintain the same frequency of the tower, but the duration of the spark is shorter. It's like lowering the duty cycle because this whole tower is actually going to operate in impulse DC. That was the big, that was the big, big thing that people don't understand with Tesla coils. Not AC, impulse DC. Um, and so that lowers the duty cycle. And you can get some more really interesting effects when you start getting below a millisecond per duration of firing. And if you use, say, two carbon electrodes or a carbon and a thuriate tungsten electrode, you can get something called negative resistance. And negative resistance is another way to get energy. Negative resistance is uh, the formation of coherent energy, while resistance is the degradation of incoherent energy. And so negative resistance is a huge concept. It's where vol current is converted to voltage, where resistance is current, voltage c converted to current. Negative resistance causes an acceleration of the electric flow because it's causing an organization of the information. <laughs> it's really all just information. And carbon has a very interesting property with um, causing this effect. And so that right there is one way to increase the voltage in the system. You can even ex directly, without interfering with the system itself, and this is one way to pull power, power out of the tower that will absolutely not degrade from the, ta the tower's oscillation or interfere with it, is by um, taking the excess energy from the spark gap radiating outwards, um, such as with Egg Gray's tube. Um, there's a lot of energy being radiated out in that spark gap that you can capture. And um, the question is how much. And if designed um, effectively, you can get quite a bit. Now, spark gap also helps in case there's a lightning strike on the tower itself, which will still damage the top of the tower as there's an insulator. Uh, but it won't damage your capacitive, capacitor bank which stores charge. And uh, it can go through a spark gap. And so one thing that you usually have after this is something has to couple with the tower. And the simplest thing to couple with the tower, if you're looking, let me adjust this. If you're looking at the top of the tower, so say this is the top of the tower, or the tower pole, you can have a spiral conductor, as Tesla said, around it. Zoom. All right. And this is what I was talking about the uh, the tunable transformer. You can couple with this tower. One way you can tune the inductance on this coil, which which is relates to this uh, concept, so you can tune to the tower, is if this is where one say electrode is connected, this one you can slide to different points and tune the inductance to couple with the tower. And Tesla talks about a quarter wavelength of them coupling. 
um, Eric Dollard talks about that the um, surface area of these primary and secondaries need to match. It's really important the surface area ma matches. And Tesla talks all about the surface area and how to increase the surface area. You want as much surface area at the top of the tower. And so that's why putting spheres on toruses or half spheres around a torus uh, is the most effective way to increase, or one, uh, one way to increase surface area. That's why I have one up fresh off the shelf. These guys are cool because they, um, they increase the surface area of a torus, besides not also having other properties. This is one of the first ones, because this is the first guy out of the new shop. So, da da da, beautiful steel magnetized octograms. Um, yeah, start sending, mailing those out, coming off the line fast. Um, and so, everyone who's pre ordered one, those will be coming your way soon. Um, the larger octograms will take a few more days um, to get done. It's a little bit harder. And so, uh, you can then take this charge and drop into a capacitor bank. And so, uh, when it's coupled into here, that goes into a capacitor bank. We'll call this our capacitor bank. Um, so if this is your primary, tower is your secondary. This primary goes into your capacitor bank, stores that charge. And before it goes in there, even though it's impulse DC, there's ways around this understanding double helix and triple helix wire, which my tower I'm using is a triple helix. Um, and that's really another topic, and I don't think I'm going to explain that in this, and though I have explained it in other videos, understanding those helixes, and how I think a double helix would pr preserve impulse DC current. Um, I haven't proved it, though. Um, I, I have to test that theory. It's not been tested. Um, but if not, uh, this primary can take the impulse DC energy, and it'll convert it to AC, and um, you want to convert it then to DC. So we're going to impulse DC to AC, and then the AC to um, to a DC charge. I'll store the store DC charge in the capacitors, um, and you can then take that charge, run it through an inverter, um, which consists of first an oscillator and the oscillator. All right, it looks like we're having a, a part two because my battery died, even though like. I looked up like 30 seconds before it died and it said I still had like an hour's worth of battery. So I don't know what happened, but I had backup. So, <laughs> uh, where did my pedals go? Alright. So, back to the drawing board. And, so I was saying the inverter it creates a 60 hertz oscillation of the DC charge. So while the reason we're converting this to a DC capacitor bank storage is so we can set the, uh, the frequency and the voltage. Then that goes into a transformer with a voltage regulator to set that. Um, I believe you have, a, I think you have a transformer and then you have a voltage regulator. And you could use a traditional iron core transformer and then that the voltage all right voltage uh, and so capacitor bank inverter which is which includes the transformer and the oscillator so we can say that's an oscillator transformer and then voltage regulator um, uh, and then you can have 120 volts 60 Hertz output to your house um, and so there's that idea behind it. The, the, the again, it's, it's trying to maintain resonance, um, with the tower, um, and, uh, keep it going. And, uh, there's ideas of how the triple helix works, which is a whole nother thing. The spark gap, um, and, and, uh, there's, 
I'm not gonna get into everything, but that's that's the gist of it. Um, but there's another way to accelerate the energy or increase your energy output dramatically, 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 dramatically. And this is what Tesla understood. So this is the whole next step. And so, shh, do a little talking first to introduce this. And so, longitudinal waves. Maxwell's equations predicted there would be longitudinal waves um, besides the transverse electromagnetic waves we're used to. As of now, longitudinal waves are considered pressure-based or acoustic. And there's a lot of fringe research in science and alternative thought about these longitudinal waves with, or electric longitudinal waves, Tesla called them. And Tesla began to understand that these waves contained more information, or there was more energy, more energy density in them, and they're also faster than the speed of light. And so I have a little sinkly. And so a longitude, a uh, transverse wave goes like this. Well, technically I'm creating a transverse standing wave as it's not moving. Uh, if I can get one boom to move through it, um, then I have a transverse wave. But if the nodes, like my hands, aren't moving, there we go, there's a transverse wave, sir. Um, but my hands aren't moving, it's a transverse standing wave. Longitudinal wave, it's compressing one, and it's going back and forth. So, and it's much faster than a transverse wave. Longitudinal waves, um, the energy transfers at the rate of direction. Um, and uh, the transverse wave travels perpendicular to the direction travel. Um, or the energy is transferred perpendicular to the uh, direction of travel. And so, uh, the longitudinal waves uh, relate to the fundamental structure, the geomet geometric grid of the Earth, and also every other planet and star. That basic structure revolves around a star tetrahedron, or Merkaba, two tetrahedrons interwoven. If there's terms in here, I'm saying, like a star tetrahedron, wiki it, google it, take a look, see the geometry, download it, study it, meditate on it, vibe it. Um, because, you know, jargon can be jargon, unless you really start to understand what I'm talking about. And so, go, go take a look at the star tetrahedron if you don't know what it is. Um, the has eight points, and so two points are pointing at the poles, you have three in the northern hemisphere and three in the southern hemisphere. You have essentially three Merkabas in, in all of these grid structures. One spin clockwise, one spin counterclockwise. And there's a point where they overlap. When they overlap, it creates the illusion of a stationary wave. Just like I was saying, the standing wave transverse. Technically, a transverse standing wave like this involves a transverse wave going left, a transverse wave going right. And when you do that, it creates the illusion of a stationary one. But a stationary wave is really composed of the yin and yang energies. Same with the stationary Merkaba of our planet. And so one of the energetic points of our planet is the, is, uh, uh, the big island on Hawaii. And the uh, volcanic hot spot is related to this energetic node. However, there's also a ring at this 19.5 degrees um, around our planet. Uh, I think that's longitude. I always get those two confused. I'm super dyslexic with longitude and latitude. Um, but east to west. Uh, there's all these other sacred sites on it. Uh, at 19.5 degrees is where the sunspots mostly occur, almost always, on the sun. It's also where Olympus Mons, the tallest known mountain in our solar system, is on Mars, and the giant red spot on Jupiter. So it's a geographic anomaly. With Earth in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, it's, as I said, uh, Hawaii, the Big Island, uh, the Bermuda Triangle, and uh, Mumbai, India. I can't remember what the uh, south is. Um, but uh, the idea I'm laying out is there's a geometric grid, a basic geometric grid that's fractalized throughout our whole planet. And that grid, it does fractalize. It keeps getting smaller and smaller. It's not saying there's a line here, but there's not another line of like 100 miles that way. The line is a density. It is the most dense point 
of that energy information. But technically, energy is everywhere. There's longitudinal pressure in all directions. And so, one of the things in understanding, say, a pyramid, is you can align a pyramid to these energies. And so, this guy, to work effectively, you want to align the edges to um, geographic north. And when that happens, um, these guys facilitate the energy flow much greatly. And it's responding to the longitudinal um, energy that's on the surface of our planet. And this is almost like a redirector or an organizer of that information. However, if you place it at specific nodes, there's greater energy density for these guys to work with. That's the idea. So I can build a tower anywhere on the planet, you're going to get energy out of it. But if you build it at specific locations, there's much greater energy density to harness. And so, we're going to go on to drawing number two. And so, we're going to have this energetic ley line like this, and this is energetic ley line like this, and this energetic ley line like this. I just made them squiggly because I felt like it. Um, they're naturally occurring on the planet, but things will influence these ley lines besides ley lines is a term that people use, um, such as uh, solar weather and uh, earth weather, so like solar flares and hurricanes, and then there's um, celestial and terrestrial geometry, such as mountain ranges and, uh, and planetary alignments, and then there's also uh, man-made geometry, and so... <sighs> Man-made geometry would include um, like pyramids and skyscrapers and the way we just build our civilizations. Anyways, it's the energy that's present will influence these because the Earth itself is the main influencer of this geometric grid, but everything else will cause these to fluctuate. But what happens is if you build, say, something right here, and something right here, and something right here, and it's the closest approximation to where these natural geometries should be, or it's the best spot to lock in these energies, then all of a sudden you stabilize these ley lines. And when they're stabilized, um, they don't waver. And you can stabilize them so you can create, say, perfect equilateral triangles or pentagons or other shapes. And when you do that, it causes them to enhance the resonance between them drastically. Not only do they enhance the, uh, the resonance drastically between them, but the overall grid itself. This is why every tree on the planet, when you cut one down, you can de you decrease the Earth's magnetic field because this is synonymous with powering the Earth's magnetic field. There's a symbiosis with all these systems. It's all interconnected. And so this relates to why the ancients built monuments at specific locations to influence these longitudinal waves. These are longitudinal standing waves. And so, if you um, have, let's say this is a node, and this is a node, and I'm going to say these are compression, and they're going to expand, and then compress, and then expand, and then... So they're compressing, and then they're going to expand, outwards, you can say, to another node. That's the expansion node. But they're, they're getting compression and expansion, and, exp and so they're going back and forth. Um, and there are two longitudinal waves traveling in both directions. And there's um, bare animations of this online. I think it's also in my structure of the Taurus, uh, the wave structure of the Taurus video. Um, and so building these towers at specific locations you're, you're tapping into the vertical energy, the electro, vertical electromagnetic energy of the Earth's electromagnetic cavity, but then you're tapping into the longitudinal energy that's parallel with the surface of the Earth. So you have parallel energy and perpendicular energy to the surface of the Earth. And you can start to drastically increase the energies in the system so much. And the longitudinal has a much greater energy density. And so this is where you get your real power output, are these systems. You get tremendous power output with these systems. The 
electromagnetic cavity essentially turns the towers on to allow you to tap into this real source. And not only when you do this and you stabilize these ley lines, which then support the electromagnetic field of the Earth, which is supporting the flow of Gaia, you at the same time are increasing the energy in this environment. Also the energy around it, but most specifically in this environment. And so, to connect this with consciousness, to me consciousness, or the infinite, God, creator, whatever you want to call it, I like the word infinite, it's everything, it is a state of infinite torque infinite twists. For us to experience ourselves, we have to slow down, we have to dumb ourselves down and come into a finite torque, a finite spin. And so when people were saying raise your vibration, we were raising also that torque. We're getting closer to the infinite. We're getting a greater connection of information. And so when you're in one of these areas where it's a higher vibration, there's a higher amount of coherence of that vibration to the Earth. And we need that vibration to survive. When the astronauts go up into space, they have to have this human resonance rebroadcast in the space shell and they'll get sick. It's something we tune into. It's a natural energy form that we need to exist. And when you raise that up, it has bioenergetic, positive bioenergetic effects on our body and the environment. And so you not only, not only support our own personal health, but say our fo farms in which we're growing food on. And so there's multiple beneficial effects of these tower systems. At the same time, you can make these towers or shrines, just like cathedrals, a place of worship. But really instead of saying it's a place of worship, it's a place of creativity. It's where we create our energy for society. Instead of having coal plants and nuclear, nuclear power plants shoved off in the background and ignored for their environmental, negative environmental effects, uh, they're at the center of our culture. And this is a place where you can go and, and meditate and, and, and aid and support in that creativity because when you align your chakras or your, your, um, your body, your back, your spine, your, your, it's, Basically, meditating that way is like a tree meditation. You're performing the same action of a tree and how your breath causes an oscillation. This idea is supported in that video of how trees dance with Gaia. And so, you yourself can become part of the power plant and understanding how your body can become in resonance to support the resonance of the tower. And it's all about understanding vibration and resonance and dissonance. And a lot of our society is based on distance, and our cosmology is based on distance, and that friction is an inevitable thing of our reality. Friction is dissonance. Think about that. Just really think about that for a second. When we are starting to use the term a lot, hey, I resonate with that. Because you're building upon that vibration. Our technology needs to build upon that vibration. And so... These towers not only stabilize the electromagnetic grid, help support the electromagnetic grid, it does so many wonderful things, such as even give us power to fuel our civilizations. And these towers can be made artistically beautiful. To our artisans are hired to fabricate them and put them into, into, into service, into creation, into manifestation. And so that's, that's the idea behind the tower. Um, there's a little bit more in terms of the components, again, the components, are, that's the general idea behind it. There's definitely some fine tuning you can do with it, and the fine tuning of the tower. The tuning process of the tower is the hardest part. Um, and there's lots of different ways to bring that tower into resonance, and ways to calculate it, so you can, say, not even have to tune it, or have automated tuning, because the tuning can change. Um, so there's lots of different concepts with the tuning process things that we could require more collaboration, like, hey, how are we going to tune this? What's the, what's the most ideal way to create a tuning system? That's, that's the, the complex thing to think about. Otherwise, the concept is simple. And uh, the jargon is extensive. <laughs> the concept is simple. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed this, and uh, feel free to ask any questions. Um, I'm going to be launching a Kickstarter for this video, uh, I mean for this project, um, and help get the shop going. And uh, I just had a $5,000 loan I was going to get to help me get the shop, which is about to move into, fall through, 
And I asked uh, my uh, guys, guidance cards, uh, which I will let's do a quick little advertisement for. Um, these are by Duarte Virtue, PhD. These are really great archetypes. Um, and usually, you'd say it's, they're reaffirmations for things I already know. And I asked the question about, you know, securing my space to work and live so I could keep moving forward with my work instead of saying, like, how am I going to get money? But securing it. And I asked that question, and I got this card. I just wanted to show it to you guys. And it's the card that's on the front of the deck. And it's Dana, High Priestess. Um, you have divine knowledge that you can help others through your spiritual teaching. So, why I'm showing you this card at the end of this video is this is what I'm doing. And this is what I'm trying to do. But we all have a purpose in this reality. And we all have to work together. Towers aren't going to manifest on their own. They're not going to manifest by me alone. That's, that's the sure thing about it. And so, the, what I have to offer is this. This is what I'm offering. But, I need help. I need help to really fulfill this offering. Because we're all in this together. We're all working together. It's not a one-man job. And so, I have the ideas. I have the willpower. I have some other things to offer. The thing I really have is the ideas. Well, there's people in this world who have the capital. I have one form of energy. They have another form of energy. And it has to be pulled together somehow. And it will. It absolutely will. Because the day I, uh, I leased the silo, which has not been paid for, it, but I leased it, was on the equinox. There's a reason that silo was leased on the equinox. There's a reason all of this is happening. And some of you may have noticed, the thing I like tying together is these extreme concepts in consciousness and science together. Because some people say that magic evolved into science. What I'm saying is magic is science. And science is magic. They're one and the same. It's just different ways to perceive it. Magic means net of power. And, well... We have the power to manifest, we have the power to create, and we have the power to understand and learn and put what we learn into effect. But the big thing is, is I can keep teaching and teaching or planting so thought seeds helping you think in a certain direction. But to know and not to do is not to know. So I can teach you all I want about this. Ain't gonna do shit until it's built and people can see it people can feel it in their own lives and then you will understand namaste my friends you enjoy the rest of your uh, day evening morning life breath joy goodness adios